Before the coronavirus pandemic, one of the first things I and millions of people around the globe used to do in the morning was to check the weather. So we could determine if we needed to bring an umbrella, a sweater, or short sleeves. But I always wonder, what if we could take the same principles of weather forecasting and apply them to epidemics? What if every morning, in addition to checking the weather, we could also check if the number of flu or malaria cases were spiking in our community? Maybe we could use that information to make sure we wash our hands more often, wear a face mask, apply mosquito repellent, or if your immunity was compromised, stay home. Before the current pandemic, people might have thought that this was something out of a science fiction movie. But the pandemic has made the possibility of this dream a reality. Many government organizations, industry, academic institutions, and even citizens exploited publicly available data to make COVID-19 forecasts. My team at Los Alamos National Lab published coronavirus forecasts for cases and deaths since early April 2020 on a weekly basis. For the United States, we publish forecasts at the county, state, and national level, but we also forecasted COVID-19 for 200 countries and territories around the globe. Prior to the coronavirus pandemic, my team and other teams around the globe had been able to forecast flu for the United States, dengue in Brazil, and a few other diseases for some countries. But we had not been able to make global forecasts. So you might be asking, what changed that made global COVID-19 forecasting possible? The simple answer is data. The coronavirus pandemic gave rise to a new data revolution. Clinical surveillance data, such as cases, deaths, hospitalizations, testing rates, vaccination rates became available on a daily basis, which is unprecedented. So epidemic modelers and citizens alike could use that information to make forecasts. Similarly, one of the key ingredients that makes weather forecasting possible is again, data. Although we only see the chance of precipitation on our weather apps, the underpinnings of these estimates are data and mathematics. These data are gathered from thousands of weather stations on land, at sea, satellites that are collecting information from the atmosphere, the ocean, the land. These data are coupled with mathematical models that predict the physics and the dynamics of the atmosphere that are ultimately packaged to provide us with forecasts. But coronavirus is not the only disease that could benefit from forecasting. Millions of people die every year from other infectious diseases that can spread through food, water, animals, and person to person. Throughout my life, I had my share of firsthand experiences on how diseases impact people. I grew up in Mexico. I'm the daughter of missionary parents. Interestingly, the first person to know when someone is sick is not the doctor, but the pastor. Members of my parents' congregations would always call first, asking them to pray for the sick before seeing a doctor. Another common theme that I heard time after time from my parents' interaction with people who had fallen victims of infectious diseases was regret. If I only knew, I would have done something different. If I knew that COVID would take my mom or dad, I would have stayed home. Information, knowledge, and data have the power to help us make informed decisions so we can change the outcome. If we know that it's going to rain, we bring an umbrella. So imagine how we could potentially use disease forecasts to not just change our behavior, but also reduce the global burden of diseases. If you and your family have not been directly impacted by COVID-19 or other infectious diseases, it's hard to appreciate and understand their impact. The toll that these diseases make on society is immense, leaving orphans and widow spouses behind. We've seen numerous articles throughout this pandemic about sons, daughters, mothers, fathers, grandparents dying from coronavirus. The consequences are truly heartbreaking. But population impacts are not the only consequence from infectious diseases. They also cause significant economic impacts due to hospitalizations, missed work, treatments resulting from in severe hardship. 
The United States Congress established the National Weather Organization in 1870 due to the economic impacts resulting from storms. In fact, the economic impacts of weather-related events such as hurricanes have been significantly reduced thanks to hurricane forecasting. Decision makers use forecasts to enact evacuations, allocate resources such as backup power generators and shelters, but it also helps farmers, military operation planning, routing aircraft, and many other people. If we could forecast the spread of infectious diseases around the globe, we could also reduce the population and economic impacts. Public health officials could use this information to design targeted educational campaigns and allocate resources to mitigate their impact. Medical health providers could use this forecast to better plan for the resources they may need to treat patients. Pharmaceutical companies could use this information to determine supply and demand of treatments and vaccine. But the general population can use these forecasts to modify their own behavior. People can plan their travel based on these forecasts, as well as make informed decisions to reduce, reduce their risk of infection. As a mathematical epidemiologist working with policymakers, I've seen firsthand how knowledge can give you decision advantage in the face of uncertainty. But predicting how diseases will spread is difficult. Weather and epidemics are very different. Weather is based on hundreds of complex and dynamic factors, such as temperature, air, moisture, wind, and atmospheric pressure. While the public only sees the simplified output of weather forecasts, they're anything but simple. Disease outbreaks are more difficult to predict since forecasts are based on a much more complex and dynamic influencer, human beings. Humans might be the most difficult creatures in the world to understand. Our habits are influenced by a broad mix of factors such as culture, our economic status, our religion, our family, our friends, our leaders, and sometimes even just our mood. Well, like epidemic forecasts, weather forecasts are not influenced by human beings in the short term. If the weather forecast calls for rain and you decide not to carry an umbrella, that's not going to change the outcome, even though we like to think so. However, if the disease forecast told you that there was going to be a high number of flu cases in your community and you choose to attend a concert or a large gathering, your behavior alone could impact the spread of disease. Respiratory infections such as flu and coronavirus transmit from person to person. Therefore, People have the power to change not only their own risk of infection, but the spread of diseases within their communities and consequently change the forecast. We're all connected when we come in contact with other people at work, at school, at the grocery store, and as such, our individual behavior will have an impact at the aggregate level. Think of the domino effect. If you get infected, you can infect your coworker. And your coworker can infect their child and that child is going to infect other children at school and so on. The COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated how important human behavior is in controlling the spread of a highly infectious disease. This is just one of the many examples that we, we've seen about the power of human behavior. Another example is the worldwide vaccination programs against smallpox that entirely eliminated the disease. But there's currently no system that can track human behavior such as face mask compliance, reduction in the number of contacts, vaccine acceptance, ability to stay home. Although several organizations conducted surveys to assess face mask acceptance and other behaviors throughout the pandemic, they were only able to capture snapshots of sentiment which cannot substitute real-time data to increase the accuracy of the forecast. Respiratory viruses are not the only ones killing people. There are many other diseases that are transmitted by various vectors that also kill people. The most dangerous animal in the world is not the shark or the snake or the grizzly bear, it's the mosquito. Illnesses such as dengue and malaria are transmitted by mosquitoes and kill an estimated 725,000 people every year. In particular, almost 
86% of malaria deaths globally are children under the age of five. The two recent epidemics of Zika and chikungunya in the Americas demonstrated how climate change is likely to increase the impact and potential spread of mosquito-borne diseases. These diseases not only cause illness, but they can shift the demographics of a generation. For example, Zika virus infection during pregnancy can cause microcephaly and other birth defects in children. As a result of this, we saw a decline in the number of children being conceived and born while Zika was spreading. So what needs to happen to forecast diseases? Disease forecast modeling is still a relatively new field. We're probably about where weather modeling was in the 1970s. You know, back when your dad would yell at the TV weather reporter because they said it wouldn't snow and then it did? Although I know COVID-19 catapulted this area for, there's still a lot to be done. Part of the reason forecasting diseases is not as good as it could be is because of how we gather our data. Current disease surveillance systems rely on various sources, including patient interviews, medical provider reports, and lab tests. Those results are sent up a bureaucratic reporting chain, first reaching the desk of public health officials and government employees. Information is not available to clinicians or researchers and the general public for days, weeks, and sometimes even months after the initial data is gathered. That means that by the time the information is publicly available, it is not very useful. Imagine what would happen if meteorologists had to rely on data from two weeks ago to make forecasts for tomorrow. The accuracy of the predictions would be low due to the lack of real-time information. Additionally, many of these data sources are aggregated as they move up the reporting system, losing their location and consequently the ability to develop forecasts at the county, municipality, or district level. But what if there were real-time sources of information that we could use that didn't rely on face-to-face -face interviews and long processing times? There are, and everyone has access to them. They're called Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, and Google. Many of these internet data streams are free or close to it and available in real time. Here's how it works. Let's say you're coming down with the flu symptoms and you post on Twitter, feeling awful, fever, chill, sore throat, really hoping it's not, hashtag the flu. And within the same day or two, several people who live or work in your community post similar updates. Simultaneously, other people living in your community Google flu symptoms or look up influenza and influenza treatments on Wikipedia. This begins to tell us that more than likely the flu is spreading in your community. But internet data streams have flaws. For one, they lack standardization. And not all data output is coupled with geographic information. We're also not sure if the information is valid and true. Just because someone posts that they have the flu, do they really? Maybe their boss follows them on Twitter and they want her to believe that they're homesick and not taking a long weekend at the beach. Then there is the question of bias, everything from age, sex, race, social status, and global reach. They can impact the reliability of the data. Language and cultural differences are also an issue. Additionally, in many countries where epidemics are common, there's no or limited internet access. In those cases, social media won't help. Although internet data streams can complement clinical surveillance systems, they cannot replace them. Therefore, we still need access to real-time case data at the most granular geographical location. So how do we make epidemic forecasting like weather forecasting? The two main ingredients for forecasting are models and data. Weather forecasting has proven mathematical models that use observations, physics, and the dynamics of the atmosphere for weather prediction. In contrast, the epidemic forecasting community has hundreds of models. We have simple mechanistic models that stratify the population into susceptible, infectious, and recovered, or SIR models. 
Then we have some more sophisticated agent-based models that simulate the population at the individual level and everything in between, such as machine learning approaches that learn patterns from historical data to data simulation models. We also saw an explosion of modeling approaches as a result of COVID. And just about everyone became an expert in SIR modeling. However, there are no vetted models in the epidemic community and we need it. The second thing we need is more data. Observations for weather forecasting are gathered from thousands of automated weather stations at various spatial and temporal resolutions. The epidemic forecasting community needs global sensors that can provide real-time observations on the environment, animal and human interactions, current disease incidents, and human behavior. But we also need a standardization of how we collect this data. The weather modeling community has a standard instrumentation and observation practices so that scientists and meteorologists all over the world can use that information. Doing all of this can go a long way to making it easier to stop the spread of infectious diseases. And I predict that someday I and millions of people around the globe, in addition to checking the weather every morning, we're also going to check disease forecasts. So we can bring both an umbrella and a face mask to work. This in turn will be able to reduce global disease burden to ultimately save lives.